in late 19th century Prague, the Jewish couple Hermann and Julie Kafka had their first child, Franz. They'd moved from the countryside to the capital of Bohemia with great ambitions and hopes for the future. Soon they had more kids. Little Franz went to a German primary school and then a German gymnasium in the same building where his father later owned a haberdashery store. Hermann Kafka was a hard-working, self-made merchant, a highly energetic and commanding man. He wanted to give Franz the best education and connections for social advancement, so placing him in an elite German-speaking environment was a logical move. Franz did well at school and then entered the German Charles University in Prague. To his family's great satisfaction, he chose to study law. In his first year, Franz joined the Reading and Debating Student Club. One day he attended a lecture on Schopenhauer, given by a fellow student, Max Brod. Normally shy and reserved, Franz took the initiative and offered to walk Max home. They had a passionate discussion and got on very well. During his university years, Franz became increasingly fascinated by literature. About that time he began to try his hand at writing. He graduated as a doctor of law and spent a mandatory year as an unpaid trainee in the civil and criminal courts. His first paid job was with an Italian insurance company, where he had a fairly busy schedule called the double shift system, which meant working from 8 am to 6 pm with a two-hour break at noon and occasional unpaid overtime. Both Franz and Max wished to combine office work, which they considered soul-destroying, with writing, which was their noble calling, so they sought out the single shift system, or working until 2 or 3 pm, which was offered by very few employers, mostly in government offices. Franz was lucky to get such a job in less than a year. In 1908 he joined the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute for the Kingdom of Bohemia. His duties included traveling to the scenes of industrial accidents, assessing workers' injuries and investigating compensation claims. As Marx later reflected, Franz gained much of his knowledge of life from his interactions with workers facing injustice. At work, he developed a skillful use of formal language and learned the intricacies of industrial and bureaucratic machinery. Our illustrations show the difference between square spindles and cylindrical spindles as it affects the technique for the prevention of accidents. The cutters of the square spindle are connected by means of screws direct to the spindle and rotate with exposed cutting edges at speeds of 380 to 400 revolutions per minute. The dangers to the operator presented by the large space between the cutter spindle and the surface of the table are obvious. Such spindles were used either because the danger was not recognized, which may incidentally have increased the danger, or with the knowledge of the presence of a permanent danger which could not be avoided. Franz was well respected in the office and quickly promoted, but still unsatisfied. In his diaries and letters to Max, Franz barely mentioned work and constantly reproached himself for not writing enough. He felt exhausted, but hesitated to give up steady job. I cannot devote myself entirely to literature as I should, for various reasons. Apart from my family circumstances, I couldn't live on literary work, firstly because I work too slowly on my things, and secondly because my health and my nature do not allow me to live on at best uncertain earnings. Nevertheless, during his first year of single shift work, Franz got his first publication in the Hamburg magazine Hyperion. Next year, Max took Franz to the Yiddish theater. The performance by a guest troupe from Lemberg not only sparked his interest in Jewish culture, but also triggered a shift in his artistic vision. Franz found that the Yiddish language, the Shasidic melodies and the essential characters of the actors were able to make one forget his reserve. Reserve was a trait of Franz's that Max constantly challenged. In 1912, on a summer trip to Weimar, he introduced Franz to a publisher, who wanted to publish his first book. All Franz had to do was decide which stories to include. The amount of material Franz chose as worthy of publication was so small that the publishers had to use an uncommonly large font, with only a few lines on each page. 
Standing at the end of the electric tram, I am completely insecure as to my place in this world, this city and my family. I couldn't even attempt to suggest what claims I am entitled to make anywhere. I can't even justify my place here, holding on to the strap, letting the tram carry me away, while others step aside or walk quietly on, or idle at shop windows. When Franz visited Max in his apartment to finalize the order of the stories in the book, he met Felice. She lived in Berlin and worked for a company that sold sound equipment. From there started their romantic relationship, mostly through postal system. All the exciting events of the last few years led to what Franz considered his creative breakthrough. One night in September he wrote a short story, The Judgment. Proud of both the speed of its completion and the outcome, Franz was unusually quick to read the story to his friends and readily gave it to Max for publication. In the story, with a notable touch of Yiddish theatre influence, Franz depicted a morbidly humorous father-son conflict. Immediately afterwards, he began work on his first novel, America, and in the same year completed his most famous story, The Metamorphosis. Life was full of fresh impressions. The 30-year-old Franz traveled around Europe with Max, attended scientific lectures, took a keen interest in alternative medicine and modern educational methods such as Montessori. According to Max, Franz was strongly attracted to simple, positive ways of life, to everything that was healthy and growing. With rising confidence, he considered quitting his job, moving to Berlin and starting a freelance career as a journalist. In July 1913, he proposed to Felice. But Felice apparently didn't support his romantic wish to quit his job and embrace uncertainty, nor did the Kafka family. Franz didn't seem happy about the ceremony, where they all discussed the terms of the marriage. As he described it, I was bound like a criminal. Two months later, the engagement was broken off. During a trip to the Danish coast, Franz wrote in a confident tone to his parents that he now planned to move to Berlin on his own and concentrate on his literary work, that he had 5,000 crowns, which would be enough to get by for a while. But these plans did not come to fruition, as the First World War brought economic turmoil and increased social pressures. However, Franz managed to fulfill at least one long-held ambition and moved away from his parents' house, renting an apartment in Prague. He continued with America and also began two new novels. In September, Franz read Max the first chapter of the trial, and in November, in the penal colony. Both stories depicted a dreamlike journey through a bizarre but chillingly realistic system of justice. Proceedings can't be prevented from moving forward, unless there are some at least ostensible reasons given. So something needs to seem to be happening when looked at from outside. This means that from time to time various injunctions have to be obeyed, the accused has to be questioned, investigations have to take place, and so on. The trial has been artificially constrained inside a tiny circle, and it has to be continuously spun round within it. And that, of course, brings with it certain unpleasantnesses for the accused, although you shouldn't imagine they are all that bad. Max recalled that Franz laughed so hard while reading that he had to stop several times to collect himself. In August 1917, just a few months before the end of the war, Franz was diagnosed with tuberculosis. He moved for a few months to the village of Zurau, where his sister Otla lived and worked on the farm. A year later, while in a sanatorium, Franz met a local girl called Julie. He described her to Max as an ordinary and astonishing girl, in love with the cinema, operettas and comedies, all in all very ignorant, more funny than sad. Almost immediately he proposed to her, but his father rejected the idea as frivolous. Franz wrote two letters. In the first, he asked Julia to continue their relationship without getting married. The second letter to his father, more than a hundred pages long, was full of reproaches. Franz gave numerous examples, starting with his early childhood, when his father oppressed him with his overwhelming temperament, ignored his interests, insulted him with unfair remarks and ironies. At the same time, Franz held him up as an example of a fully accomplished man and the head of a family, unlike himself, since it was impossible to marry, when his father disapproved of all his attempts. Soon the affair with Julie was over. A new romantic pen friend of Franz, Milena, insisted on their breakup. However, Milena herself was married and didn't plan to leave her husband. So Franz eventually cut off their intense but very short relationship.
Apparently at this point Franz abandoned his attempts to fix his personal life and achieve his ideal of a successful family man. He concentrated on his writing, moving forward with the trial and beginning the castle. The new novel was set in a snow-covered village, resembling Franz's current surroundings. The protagonist tried to get accepted, but only caused misunderstandings among the locals. I tell you how shockingly ignorant you are of circumstances here. A person's head fairly spins just listening to you, comparing what you say and think with the situation as it really is. Such ignorance can be portrayed all at once, perhaps not at all, but there can be a good deal of improvement if you will only believe some of what I say and keep in mind your ignorance all the time. Franz was still working at the institute, now as a chief clerk, but with long breaks spent in sanatoriums. His publisher encouraged Franz to be less indifferent to the fate of his books and to give him something new to publish, but Franz could not bring himself to finish any of his novels. In 1922 he finally decided to retire. Next year on the Baltic coast Franz met Dora, a young nursery teacher from a strict orthodox Jewish family. They immediately fell in love with each other. Franz returned home full of courage. His decision to move to Berlin and live with Dora was firm and soon carried out. A comic image of their first landlady can be found in an unusually light-hearted story, The Little Woman. From Berlin he wrote to Max that for the first time he felt happy and even slept well. Franz and his loved ones were full of hope that his disease wouldn't progress too quickly although it was incurable at the time, with an average life expectancy of three years. Deprived of his future with its distressing challenges and obligations, Franz finally enjoyed his life as it was. He earnestly worked on his novels and keenly studied Hebrew with Dora. The couple fantasized about moving to Tel Aviv and opening a Jewish restaurant together. Dora would cook and Franz would work as a waiter. The very next year, in April, Franz's condition suddenly worsened, and he was sent from the sanatorium to a clinic in Vienna. The only car available for the trip was an open one. It was raining and blowing. All the way, Dora stood up in the car and tried to protect Franz from the bad weather with her body. He died in June, one month before his 41st birthday. In his will, Franz asked Max to burn all unpublished manuscripts and to refrain from republishing those already in print. But Max disobeyed and published not only Kafka's books, but also letters and diaries. Dora burned some papers and those she kept were confiscated by the Gestapo. She later got married and named her daughter Francisca after Franz. Franz's sisters, as well as Milena and Julia, died in Nazi concentration camps. Felice moved to the USA and opened a clothing shop. To cope with her finances, she sold her letters from France to a publisher. In 1988, the original manuscript of the process was sold for $1.8 million and is now kept in the Museum of Modern Literature in Germany. 